Good evening, everyone, um, and a very warm welcome to the Henry Moore Institute's new series of online talks. Uh, on the theme of fabrication, this is the inaugural event, so a very warm welcome. Um, the season is going to be running from now until the end of July. And we've got a variety of different talks in conversations uh, and conferences on the theme of fabrication, which uh, is kind of the, one of the best kept secrets of the art world, really. So we have a few aims over the next few months um, of what we want to achieve with this series of talks. And one of them is demystifying some of the practicalities of how sculpture is made. Um, we as audiences for sculpture only get to see a finished product. So uh, demystifying some of the, um, the processes of how sculpture is made um, seems to me to be a really crucial step in understanding it. Um, we also want to acknowledge the relationships between artists and skilled fabricators. Um, there are really important processes of exchange, exchange and collaboration that take place when artists work with fabricators. Um, and we want to reveal some of those and acknowledge those collaborations. Um, we also want to explore the way that within fabrication um, and art and that relationship, there are a lot of blurred lines between art and craft and industry. Um, and we're going to be covering that um, later on in the season um, with um, a conference uh, on the subject of art, craft and industry. We also want to look at ways in which making sculpture has changed. Uh, and there are a number of factors in that technological processes that have developed over time, as well as more recently, um, artists and fabricators working under the conditions of the COVID pandemic. Um, and in particular, we're going to be talking later on in the season about um, embracing new technologies within fabrication. And I think that some of that is definitely going to come up um, in today's discussion. Um, we've developed this season of events in collaboration with Pangea Sculptors Centre and as well as our four fantastic speakers who I'm going to introduce shortly. Um, I'm really delighted that we're joined this evening by Lucy Tomlins from Pangea. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Lucy for a moment so she can tell you more about what Pangea does. Thanks Claire. Um... We're really, really pleased to have developed this season of talks with the Henry Moore Institute as, um, yeah, fabrication is such an instrumental part of the ecology of sculpture and yet so often the importance of the role it plays and the relationship between artist and fabricator and different approaches to this relationship get overlooked. And we're pleased to be able to give fabrication a moment in the spotlight and with our speakers and you, the audience, to share insights into this often hidden part of the sculptural discipline and how this sphere is navigated. I'm delighted we're kicking off the season today with our first round table, Fabrication as Career, given how many artists, future, past and present, will at some time or other find themselves sustained by jobs in the industry. And before I hand back to our chair, Dr. Claire O'Dowd, um, some general Zoom housekeeping um, for this evening. So this event is being recorded and will be available on the Henry Moore Institute YouTube channel next Wednesday, as well as on the Henry Moore Institute and Pangea websites. For those that need them, subtitles can be turned off and on by clicking the live transcript button on the bottom toolbar, which is the one with the CC symbol on it. Um, if at any point your video freezes or you're having connection issues, we recommend restarting Zoom and you can rejoin using the same link. Questions and comments are welcome uh, and can be submitted using the chat function, which can be found on the bottom toolbar. If you want us to mention your name, please include it in the message. Um, otherwise, we'll keep it anonymous. Um, OK, I think that's it. I'll hand back to you, Claire. Thank you very much, Lucy. Um, so today's discussion um, is going to explore a number of different aspects of fabrication and fabrication as a career. Um, we're going to look at how artists and fabricators move between those two careers, um, what kinds of skills are needed, both to become a fabricator and to work with fabricators, um, and how those skills and the relationships are developed, um, right from art schools through to industry experience. And we're also um, gonna be thinking about some of the more 
maybe philosophical questions that surround um, ideas of making and creativity and the ways in which we classify different kinds of practices. So we have four absolutely brilliant guests um, and they all have very different perspectives on fabrication. Um, and I'm gonna introduce our four speakers. So we, we start with Simeon Barclay, um, who is a Leeds-based artist. Uh, Simeon studied at Leeds Met and then Goldsmiths, where he gained his, his MA in 2014. And Simeon's work uh, draws on different strands of popular culture and cultural histories. Um, and it reflects on a lot of complex ideas of memory and inheritance and aspiration. Um, Simeon has exhibited nationally, um, including Tate Britain, South Bank Centre, Baltic, Liverpool Biennial, um, and internationally across Europe and America. And before beginning his fine art degree, Simeon worked as a fabricator. So he made the move from industry into art. Our next guest is Rui Pignatelli. Um, Rui graduated with a licentiate degree in sculpture from the Fine Arts University of Lisbon, uh, where he also ran an artist residency space and he was involved in the production of two editions of the Biennial of Young Artists from Europe and the Mediterranean. In 2007, Rui moved to London to study for his MA in Fine Art at um, St Martin's. And this background in sculpture and this experience as a maker led him to start what is now um, a decade long career as an art fabricator. Our third speaker is Karen Rugaba, um, who is Professor of Fine Art at the Slade School of Fine Art at UCL, and she is Head of Graduate Sculpture. Karen is a practicing artist. Um, she's interested in the translation of pictorial principles into sculpture and how imaginary space materialises within sculptural language and public space. Karen has exhibited all over the world, um, including at Pier and Tate Britain and Greengrassy in the UK, as well as across Europe and the US. Uh, she was recently commissioned by Seldorf Architects um, to produce a permanent wall relief uh, in Greenwich Village in New York. And in 2019, she was the recipient of an Abbey Fellowship Award at the British School in Rome. And finally, um, I'd like to introduce Nigel Schofield. Um, Nigel is um, a director of MDM Props, um, the highly respected fabrication company who celebrated their 25th anniversary in 2019. So Nigel holds um, a BA in 3D design as well as further qualifications specialising in working with wood and metal and, practice, uh, and plastics. Nigel began his career as an artist and model maker working in theatre, film and TV um, and later joined MDM. He has worked with artists at all levels but he has a very illustrious client list um, and notable uh, mentions include Damien Hirst, Anselm Kiefer, Anish Kapoor, Yoyo Kusama, Marina Abramovich, Tracy Emin and Anthony Gormley and he's worked with the British Museum and the National Gallery. Uh, so I'm delighted to welcome our speakers tonight and all of you and we'd like to begin this evening by hearing a little bit from all of our panellists about their own careers and experiences. Um, so Nigel, if we can start with you um, and hear a little bit more about your work uh, and your experience with MDM. Hi, yes. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? We can. Good. Um, so I think it would be a good idea to show you a bunch of photographs of the sort of work we do, because I think fabricators can be pigeonholed into things like bronze foundries, stone carvers, metal workers, model makers, whereas you really need to be able to do a bit of everything. So I think the easiest way to show that is to show you a bunch of photographs of the sort of scope of work of things that we make, for example. I'm then going to show a bunch of pictures on one particular job, um, which has used quite a few new techniques or new to us when we started them, but they're more commonplace today, but they're very prevalent in art manufacturing now. Um, but let me do screen share. Uh, 
And voila. So this is a piece, um, fourth plinth in London. It's got lots of different materials in this as well as air conditioning systems. So it's not your normal run of the mill fabrication. It's quite a complex one that um, acrylic from Italy, rest of it from the UK. This is a very standard enlargement. This was done by hand with someone Nigel, with normal- sorry, we love. can't see your screen share. Oh. <laughs> Hang on. Can you see it now? There we go, we've got it, thank you. Still see it? Yeah. Yes. Yay, so that one, first one, that's a, the one I was talking about, big bottle ship in it. Um, air conditioned, very complicated piece to make. Um, lots of skills involved, lots of people. Everyone in the whole village was working on it and it, it took everyone to make it work. Very standard enlargement, this one in bronze, um, done with calipers and the old school methods employed since you know, ancient Greeks and then into bronze. So very different. Um, this one was all metal fabrication from a design that the uh, designers said it wasn't possible to build so you've got another set of restraints on you there that you've got to overcome but you can usually overcome things with the right people another big thing this is the first thing we ever made with a computer controlled um, cutters it's a big uh, Kapoor work um, it disappears into the wall but it's made in a shipyard so a lot of experience gained there working with the shipyards who've got very contemporary techniques more traditional, how to mould bin bags um, in bronze. So very old traditional techniques there of plaster and grog and mould making. And then into bronze, standard bronze, all made um, sort of for real in wood and clay, and then straight to a foundry to turn into bronze. So quite a traditional route, that one. This one massive, built around cranes and using transparent fiberglass. So an awful big learning curve for everyone involved. And it's not the sort of thing like an art fabricator would normally be asked to make, but that's a big rock and roll piece. But great thing to learn a lot on very quickly. This is a plane. Again, you never know what people are gonna ask you to do. So this is a plane hanging up with feathers painted on it like a hawk, um, quite complicated and something you can't really plan for in your kind of a, how am I gonna learn how to make things? School of life, you've just gotta get on with it when you get it and work out a pragmatic way to do it. Work really nicely though. Um, repeat work, there's an awful lot of repeat work in fabrication. So this is one heart times God knows how many and very boring, but there's a lot of that involved. Same with this, a lot of these get made. These are mirror rooms full of um, uh, LEDs for, um, Kusama, um, they're very technically skillful and you need to be very good at wiring, electronics, etc. The rest of it is just really a set and it's very simple, but the effect is stunning when it's, when it's finished. More strangeness, this is large scale wax pieces moving around on, um, a tr there's a train underneath there. Um, so again, you need engineering skills for that and the ability to kind of shovel wax which is, I think everyone's got that ability. Water, working with water, do quite a bit of pieces like this. Um, this is a whirlpool. So in the bottom of that pond, there's a big um, sort of propeller thing. So do not fall in, um, but good to learn how to do it. You know, a one-off really, but nice to work on. Neon works, a lot of neon works, another specialist thing. A lot of it in the art world in the last five years. Imagine there still will be. Lots of light-based pieces, so you need to have lighting skills. Um, very hard to get lighting skills. It's easier to employ someone who's a lighting specialist to come and help you, which is what we did in this case. Uh, this piece was had to be very sustainable, so you're researching very sustainable ideas. This is a made out of wicker and um, hessian, and the water it goes out. It went outdoors, and the water sort of falls through it, so it doesn't get too heavy and. It returns back to nature quite quickly, that one, because it's very uh, um, nature-based. Um, a lot of museum work we do as well. The art world would um, 
um, cross fertilized with the museum world quite well. So this is an octopus for Natural History Museum. This is made out of old um, milk holding containers that are all polished and put together. Who'd, who'd have thought? Yeah, they look great. Uh, blood, this is heads, life cast in blood. So again, you can't really plan for that, but you can put together the ability to do a life cast and um, abilities to um, make ice lollies, basically, and you can end up with a piece like that. Inflatables, um, inflatables are, um, again, a specialist thing, but you know sometimes you need to get involved with them. Standardized piece, this is fiberglass with a paint job on it, and it's um, map of the world upside down, but very pretty piece, quite standard, and uh, lots of people have the skills to do that. Concrete forming, so use building technology there to do those. Um, and uh, fairly simple, repetitive, heavy. So this is an example now, I'll a few photos now of um, a project that used quite uh, modern technology. This is a um, militant faucet statue for Parliament Square. And the artist Julian Waring had this idea for this based on this picture of a, a monument to her but she wanted it to be done in a very particular way. So we got a, a person, it's actually one of our um, project managers, this to dress up. And we took it to one of those places where you get a 3D print done. Um, and that's her as the first step. She's then been scanned here at the uh, LucasArts facility up in um, Pinewood for the Star Wars films with photogrammetry. So she can be captured wearing a period costume in absolute super detail. That again, that then gets transferred into a digital file like this that the artist messes around with and manipulates endlessly until they're happy with it. It's kind of the sculpting period for the artist. It then gets printed. So these panels are 3D prints that get assembled as a plastic um, printout, full size. Gillian, the artist for this, was very involved with um, the tapestry and the um, sewing work, the needlework, the fabric work. So we based um, the, the, the flag she's holding on the um, suffragist banners and the, the beautiful work that went into them. They are stunning close up. Um, so there's lots of uh, research into fabric works there um, and banners, full size mock ups. We cast Julian's hands, so we life cast them in a traditional method and then 3D printed them so that they're actually her hands holding the banner, which is a neat touch. The head was hand modeled because um, it's a likeness that didn't exist anywhere. So that was sculpted in clay um, and then cast out. It then goes on a plinth and the plinth she wanted to use um, engraved uh, plates like this, which are engraved in black granite. They're very beautiful, very subtle, very evocative of the photos of the time. This is her layout of all the granite plates. And that's how they arrive if you don't get it right. So that was a bit of a disaster because every one of them arrived like that, broken. So once you get your second set and you've learned how to transport granite around, you can do it properly and fit them onto the plinth like that. So it's a very, very simple looking monument, but there were some incredible technological steps made used uh, to build this piece. Um, it's absolutely stunning close up as well as good from a distance, but I think a lot of the technologies is hidden within it. Um, but it's a very nice piece and very proud of that one and a good illustration of contemporary art fabrication. And that I think is the end of my little clips brilliant thanks Nigel that was it's really fascinating to see the process from start right. to finish. so there's a lot for us to unpack there um we, we'll now hear um if you're ready Karen um we'll hear from Karen um, more about your practice um as an artist and also your experiences uh in teaching sculpture as well I think yeah, okay, well, thank you. Thanks for the invitation. I'm just going to try and screen share. Hopefully that works. Uh, oops. Uh, can you see a full screen? Yeah, 
Okay, great. Um, so yeah, so um, I will talk about um, a bit about my own work and some of the teaching projects that I'm I'm doing a professor at the Slate. I think uh, I was already introduced, I suppose, uh, and I also am a practicing artist. So in a sense, I wear two hats, but they're the same, I would say, because uh, in so many ways we teach as artists, for artists, but you could also question what you mean by teaching. And I think it's a kind of creating of a frame uh, to make um, something possible. And to what's interesting, I think, to me about fabrication, I think, is that it comes to an artist's mind. And most fabricators I know are artists or have an artist background. And I think it was quite interesting to see in the previous um, Nigel's um, talk, I guess, about you know those unexpected things. And that's really interesting. So anyway, so my own work um, is very handmade. I think I'm not using a lot of fabrication at that level. Um, I guess I'm more involved with using people or working with people in a stage that is outside of and, and then gets out of my hands and I, I have to find solutions for and um, but these things are directly handmade so I've been working with um, um, concrete for a long time and they're individually uh, hand cast so this is a piece I made for example for a town gallery in uh, an exhibition in 2019 so each of the elements are hand cast by waste mold so each it's, it's an individual thing you can't really repeat. Um, I, I like casting as a sort of general um, um, method because it is a completely um, dispersed material. It's water and powder and any, it can be anything and it concretizes itself. So it, it becomes an instant geology um, and then it's like an object. And I, I'm really interested in this, in this, con in this sort of conf confrontation with the object, but also the scale in which it can then operate, which I think is um, my ideal situation is uh, an architectural surface or an architectural scale. Um, and it's to do with finding form and series and ornamentation, figuration. So lots of these things I think are there. Um, I'm just gonna run through a few of those pieces. The scale is really important. Also how I experience myself against the scale in terms of literally being in front of it and, um, the idea that it's a relief cast is, it's almost like an image, but it's not an image. It's a, it's a physical object and it's a facade in so many ways. Um, and something to do with translating a scale, I think, from when you make it and then onto the larger um, object, which is the wall or a building, something like that. Um, I've been making quite a few of those over the years. Um, there are series ongoing, which allows me to do anything in a way and any scale. So they're very small. This one is a very small piece. Um, and then they kind of, you know, there can be any scale, so to speak. Um, and I have made a few pieces for external situations, which is interesting because then you have suddenly this whole situation of external weather and influence of the elements and also how do you fix it and security and, and, and getting it up there and and, um, and also the imagination of how you translate something that's made in your hand onto a larger scale um, for it to have some um, impact or not, you know, or, or sort of what, what does it mean to suddenly have a, a your own thing against a, a scale of, a, of an archi architectural building. Um, so this, for example, is something I'm doing right now, which is um, which started out actually as a as a sketch for a mural and planning, but it then became a work, and now I'm sort of trying to sort of it has a lot of very loose elements, and it becomes um, a kind of thing where then I have to sort of make something to make that more permanent. Currently, it's paper and wire and you know bits of plants and fabric and so on, and in a way. Um, the energy of that, how do, how do I translate that into something that's more fixable or even movable? So that's, yeah, the kind of thing that, that's happened there. And this is what, this is the actual studio process. So for example, the piece in Towner Gallery early on, this is how they're literally made. So they're made by um, clay molds that I then undo and I literally remake them. I mean, I have a sort of few shapes that I repeat, but then I make the waste mold, um, new every time, which is kind of um, 
yeah, I, I suppose a very basic process, but I also can't repeat it. So when something breaks and I have to remake it, if it breaks in the process or something, I can't, I can't actually remake the exact copy, which is, I guess, part of the appeal, maybe. I'm not sure about something along those lines. But it's also about um, translating something from the floor to, the, to then this other space. I mean, I have made floor pieces as well, but it's how you relate to it when you stand up as to when as to when you're looking down on something or up on something and away from you and so on it's sort of to do with it, all this um uh, so this is for example then um, there's other stages to it where where you then have to figure out a template or a scale of how it would translate into a, a project into a, into a building that you're you're not necessarily having access to and so here i work from a plan and um, we were we were sort of mocking it up in real in real life, so to speak, in real scale, um, which then you know it sort of the entirety of it became really complicated to to map and and then to, to translate and ship and so on. So it became, yeah, it's something I think uh, um, that then needs all these different processes and and people and maybe also um solutions i suppose yeah so this is something i mean maybe i can play this this is something that i've just been doing right now and it's to do with during the lockdown it started in some ways it's like the opposite scale so it's the scale of my hand quite literally they're small brooches um a kind of series of things that have been um i've been making throughout but it's also about finding um a sequence and as a sort of vocabulary of of form again and then sort of finding ways of ordering them and and um i suppose um the pieces with wire are very um also to do with the space of the hand but also very unwieldy and and instant and quick um uh it's it's a kind of well difficult to talk about this actually so anyway i'll, I'll just carry on um how do I go for the next one? So yes, uh, these are just some external pieces. Um, I suppose what I'm saying is that the the scales um, of something in in my in the work that I'm making are can be from like literally handheld to wanting to span a kind of whole um, a whole side of a building and. Um, uh, are also something to do with with functionality on a large on a on a on, a, on some sort of level um, in the sense that this is wearable poss possibly or it it has a sort of suggested function but possibly also not I mean they're just instant small sculptures um, yeah uh, then this is another piece that is a is a piece to do with a with a with an existing situation with a with an architectural situation but it's exactly the opposite to, to the previous pieces it's a it's a, um, a show that i did where i worked with a fountain for the space of a couple of weeks um which meant basically working with very unstable materials water and plants and wire and elements and like heat and, and then it became like algae was growing and so on and it almost like defied literally the idea that it became something solid ever and um it's not repeatable and then you know it, uh, yeah anyway i should i should move on i think a little bit um so then in my teaching um i think uh, i think basically teaching from an artist's point of view it to, to me the important thing is that you don't really know what you're what you're what you want but you you find what you want and you find a sort of in a sense a way of finding form or finding your process or finding your language so i ran a series of workshops at slade and at other places as well low-tech casting workshops which is basically a way of understanding what how can casting be undone so in a way how can you make something that isn't necessarily a traditional way of doing something but how can you find a mold what can be a mold what can be a material how can you mix materials that supposedly shouldn't go together but they might create something that might be interesting and or recycle something 
And people did really interesting things. These are students that signed up specifically for it. They often came either from an art background and wanted to have a go at it, or they knew nothing about casting, or they were architects that came in and, you know, intrigued by sort of understanding materials and so on. This is somebody who was trying to cast movement. So he was trying to make something, a mold that, that represented them, you know, it's, I guess casting movement doesn't go together normally, but that's what he was trying. And quite low tech approaches then allow you also to sort of make mistakes. And I think in general, um, just understand how things hold together or don't hold together and break apart or something. Um, so there were very interesting things that came out of this. And also I was not necessarily teaching, but setting a frame for it and doing my own experiments within this. I was experimenting with scent and concrete and whether this can be made some, you know, you can make something that smells or captures a scent within a, a solid material and so on. Um, and, and also, um, I, th I think in a, in a lot of ways, this unlearning or, or sort of doing things you shouldn't uh, or are not allowed to do normally, I think it helps you um, or mistakes maybe help to open up other things and, you know, undo existing knowledge. And this is, I think, the whole issue with teaching skills, in my view, that I think teaching skills is a complicated thing because in a way you do need to provide uh, a sort of set of um, traditional ways of making things, but also if that is the only thing, then people often don't come to something that could open other things up or, um, yeah. Uh, so this is another um, a strand of a research project that, that I'm running at the Slate, um, which is connecting to other science, um, science uh, laboratories. So UCL Earth Science is a discipline which is um, spanning geology and um, physics and solar physics and so on and, and, and space science and so on. And they have interesting laboratories. This was, for example, a uh, ice physics laboratory, which is a permanent uh, space uh, at minus 20, minus 15 and minus 20. And we were given um, a free reign there for two days to experiment how you could, how that could change a material or what happens to materials, what happens to your own sense of yourself in that uh, understanding of um, temperature and, you know, quite literally, what 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 could what could emerge so this is for example sorry this is for example a, a sort of cast cappuccino which was quite funny we then did a we d we then did a, a a melting display of it after two days when, when everything came out and you know interesting things started to happen um and the students were yeah it was quite literally a sort of um yeah, a, 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 an extreme experiment because also it was emotionally very draining uh, to be in this space. This is the uh, the melting display, which at the end of it, not much was left. <laughs> so for example, in one of these, um, uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse. Can you see my mouse? Yeah. So this was, for example, a um, somebody had cast dust um, and this dust then behaved in a completely interesting way where, um, we, we created a sort of water tank around it and then it just became this kind of in incredibly interesting floating uh, sort of um, uh, lens and, and, and then things were like embedded, for example, hair, but also other, thing, other um, materials weren't necessarily water-based, but they just br became really brittle in that, in that environment and so on. Um, then uh, I think also one of the things I find really interesting in the teaching is to deal with, um, I did a one day sculpture park with the students at the UCL Mallard Space Science Laboratory, which is a, a science facility. And they have these amazing grounds in Surrey, a big park, and they also have laboratories there. And it's very peculiar because they have, um, they work with solar science or, um, you know, space science. Uh, developing materials for outer space quite literally but also um, to interact with scientists and that way of thinking um, became it sort of clashes with sculpture but it also is very similar I think in so many ways oh yeah sorry, sorry okay I, I can see your hand waving um, 
I, yeah, so the last slide is, for example, this is a material that they use in, it's a high temperature coating material that they use in solar orbitals. So that material, when you looked at it close up, was almost not visible. It became quite literally like it absorbed the light. It's difficult to see it in photographs, but it just swallowed light. Um, yeah, anyway, I think that's my end of the presentation. So um, I stop sharing. Thank you very much. And I hope um, I can say a bit more later, but yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Karen. You can definitely say more later. That was really fascinating. Um, especially the, the the idea of translating things between different scales and media that that really fascinates me and I think I'd really like to talk to you more about that in a moment um Rui Rui Pignatelli are you ready to tell us about your work um yeah can you hear me yes we can hear you cool um so I think I will I will I think I'll focus on the trajectory um that got me to today um um, so yes, yeah, so before that, we'd like to thank the Harry Moore Institute. Um, so yeah, but focusing on the trajectory, um, um, so I started on an academic level. I first attended fine arts um, sculpture in Lisbon, uh, and then moved to London to um, to pursue an MA in fine arts at St Martin's. Um, school in in um, in Lisbon was very different from my experience in the UK. Uh, the course was very compartmentalized, so uh, we have very determined subjects. So we had art history philosophy, aesthetics, visual theory, anatomy, geometry. Um, and then we have what was called technologies. And these were like technical subjects that were mandatory as part of the course and made you attend and populate the studios for the whole of uh, your stay in school. So this is like wood carving, very traditional things, wood carving, stone carving, mold making, metal work. Um, and this was in, in effect my first contact with, with a lot of different skills in a, in a, in a short period of time. Um, we had 24 hour um, access to the studios uh, that were mainly unsupervised. So we were completely unsupervised. Uh, we could experiment at will, fail, take risks, take, uh, get familiar with materials and machines. Um, and this was completely different from, uh, from what we found at, at CSM in London, where we had sort of like an almost conceptual access to the, to the workshops. You had to book, yeah, there was a whole planetary alignment and alignment that had to take place. Um, I think there were two key moments on my early days in school that defined sort of like my path, my life since. Um, and the first one was um, when I made my first large scale sculpture, which was like a large metal mesh um, come up to like 3.2, 3.4 meters high. Um, and I remember walking back from it and having like little butterflies thinking, you know, I made that. Uh, with my own hands and it was uh, like you know it was something that was bigger than me it was just like just my scale it was just it was it was it was quite fascinating um and the other one was um visiting the old sachi gallery in london uh where which wilson was showing his um 2050 the the, the room full of uh, black oil black motor oil um and that's when kind of like i decided that i wanted to be involved in this kind of like world of magic that installation it, it was really sort of like a magic space that he had created um, on that space um so when i was accepted at csm i was lucky to be awarded the cecil lewis scholarship for um, sculpture which made my stay in london very easy um but when you left when i left school i had to uh, you know i had rent and other basic obligations that to attend to so um i found a place at uh, mdm with nigel uh and um, uh, there was a big project happening and they were in desperate need for mold makers. So I kind of blagged my way in with the help of a friend that was already working there and got straight on with the job. Um, and when I say the job, I mean like learning. Um, I, I thought I knew a thing or two about mold making, but this was totally different. This was, this was a company, you had a job, you had a mission, you had timesheets, you eventually even got paid. Um, so MDM has something that I never encountered before. It was, it was a business in the business of making other people's artwork. So I had obviously known of artists that were using studios um, to make things, but not studios that were almost exclusively operating in this way. So, and the most fascinating thing about working there was that most people came from an art school background. Um, so it was not unusual to 
end up um, sharing each other's websites, sharing work, um, talking about our work, and going to private views after work. It was it was sort of a continuation from school in a way. Um, so that was the next six, seven years of my life, um, working with a really amazing group of people, finding solutions to make complex artworks. Um, like the one Nigel was saying, I was really happy to see some of the couple of pictures I was involved in. Uh, um, so every project shared some technical aspects, but it also had something added to or altered from your previous knowledge base. So it just always keeps you evolving. Um, the people were more or less organized in the workshop by skills, um, but most were in like what we in the, in the industry we call like all rounders. You end up doing a bit of everything. And if you don't know, you just ask and you just end up finding ways of doing it. It, it was super rich and it was a growing experience um, working as a team to solve problems. Um, problems to, to, to create that magical catch the space I was talking about uh, when I saw Rich's um, e exhibition. Uh, and I, I, and I was fortunate enough to end up working um, uh, with Richard um, in a couple of projects uh, at MDM. So I was, uh, yeah, I was, I was fortunate enough to, to have that kind of connection experience between working, seeing Richard's work and then meeting him later um, at the studio. He's a fantastic person. He's one of those artists that really gets involved um, with the fabrication is there. It was not, it was not uncommon to find him hands-on in the studio doing something. Uh, I, I remember once cycling of uh, MDM and he was just breaking up some metal work right in the end of the, by the gate, which, you know, sort of like a, a Zen thing. Um, there were numerous episodes that I recall uh, being a part while working. Um, so I, one of them was, uh, and now it's that, that's the image number two. So I ended up inside the, the acrylic uh, next to the World Opera House and we, MDM, we had installed that uh, and something had kind of like came out of place and I was the skinny volunteer to go inside the sphere. Um, so uh, yeah, I think there were, we, we kind of done the people in the workshop that actually fit the gap between the thing. So I was one of two and the other one kind of said, adamantly said, no, thank you. Um, so, so I did. So, um, so it took a while to, to, uh, to acclimatize. Um, but uh, yeah, and then at some point, bad things come you know, for good reasons. At some point I had a serious bicycle accident and uh, MDA was kind enough to have me on a sort of advisory role for one or two jobs. Um, since I was on crutches, I was pretty useless on the shop floor. Um, so I ended up eventually moving on to another fabrication studio where I was doing a bit more managing at the same time uh, while still making. Um, and I, I realized at the time that I had acquired lots of, uh, like a set of skills, like pretty broad set of skills that I wasn't really aware of, but it was when, when that kind of managing situation came into play that I realized that it was there. Um, and I have had my own studio um, in Hackney since I left school. Um, it started being my art studio uh, and the space has, always, has kind of like progressively morphed into being my own fabrication studio. Um, where I mostly work as a, either a solo fabricator or I have one more, two people, it's, it's, it's just, but it is my space. Um, I think the core of our job is solution finding, like Nigel was saying, um, and that's the part that I really love. Um, I have, it, personally, I have been moving from fabrication to production managing role, which I found that is kind of links up with this kind of all-rounder experience. Um, you need to know a bit of everything. You need to be aware of all stages of the process. Uh, and that really comes into play. Um, and it's advantageous for you and the client, uh, you, the client being the artist. You, you, this is another thing you sometimes you forget that, you know, it's the client, the artist is this kind of like thing. Um, and I just want to finish by saying that um, one of the most striking things that I realized after becoming an art fabricator was that um, trying to explain your line of work outside the realm of people that, you know, that are not into the art world is not easy. Um, and you often, when you often say, look, you know, I make other people's artwork, I make other people's sculptures or art for them, it's invariably followed by the phrase, do you mean artists don't make their own work? Um, and yeah, well, sometimes they do, sometimes they need help. Um, and this is sort of definitely like a bubble bursting moment for, um, for some people that are not, not in, in the space, in the, in, in, in the medium. 
um, that I think is perpetuated by us um, as much as by the artists. Um, and we're all part of that myth. It's, 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 it is still a myth, I think. Anyway, thank you. That was brief. Thank you, Rui. Um, yes, I remember the moment when um, that myth was popped for me as well, and it was a terrible shock to the system. Um, that was really fascinating to hear about. Um, and there's a lot in there that I want to come back to as well. Um, the, the ideas about um, problem solving and so finding solutions, I think are, are really crucial in terms of what you do. Um, so let's finally hear from Simeon. Simeon, are you ready to share your screen and tell us about your work? Yes, just about, just bear with me. Um, I'm sharing my screen, yes. Fantastic. Great stuff, okay. Um, so um, I'm gonna come at this subject with a scattergun approach, firing thoughts and ideas, touching upon aspects of fabrication and the industry in general that have had a lingering effect and influence on the work that I do now. As was mentioned in conversation earlier this week, my trajectory into the art world is kind of in reverse. For those of you that don't know, this observation comes from the fact that before entering art education, my previous 16 years had been spent in, in a background of production and fabrication. So yeah, I left school at 16 without any qualifications and entered an apprenticeship in engineering. In reality, I went from a failing educational system to the last crumbling remnants of a fallen empire, one that was in the midst of deindustrialization. I should have seen the writing on the wall. I surveyed even then the legacy of hollow mills standing as mausoleums to an outdated technology, redundant punctuations in the landscape. Still with the cockiness of youth, I could count myself lucky. I had a job, I was earning, I had independence, and my employee number was number 10, the same number worn by Diego Maradona. Still, it was a daunting prospect for a boy, a boy in a man's world. There was a pervading masculinity, a grittiness made of myth and stark conditions that within the factory seeped into every molecule. It was in your pose your stance, the way you spoke, the way you ate, the way you opened your newspaper, the way that you physically held yourself, the way you picked up and handled objects, the way you dumped a big shit down the toilet and bragged about it or blamed it on somebody else. It was about a type of working class machismo and the authenticity of being real or being hard. I had a sense of it in my everyday existence. It was my PE teacher, my father. It, had ev it was every bad boy Hollywood heartthrob with a gun. Its essence had slowly seeped into my being. It's what I call the burden of in inheritance. Machismo for these men at work represented a shield and armor to a world in flux, a fear of change a bolstered self-esteem for men who, despite society pissing on them from a great height, still can't, still can't afford the indignity of looking stupid. They made things. They were makers, thinkers, workers, real work, real things. I still covet the term maker. Maker might seem a dirty word. In fact, artists, sculptors, might be, might be offended by the term. But up to this day, I've still been a maker for more years than I've been an artist. So depending on my particular frame of mind or my temperament on a given day, I choose to own the term. Class also has a factor to play here, I feel, especially here in Britain, where manufacturing, making things over worker has never really been celebrated nor given heroic status. Unlike America where the fireman, the construction worker has an aura about them. Even the art of America of a certain generation 
proven incorporation and reproduction of industrial processes paid homage to its country's industrial advance. I think it comes down to status and ego and the misconceived idea that an artist thinks through making and the maker just makes, which is misleading. Uh, so some of the best installations I've seen have been in the belly of a working workshop. It's vastness, the overwhelming sensation of visual information, the scale, the movement, the mid-gray colored floor paint, the orchestration of machinery transporting moving parts, color coding, denoting objects, fit and proper designation, hazard strips, a detail redolent of a motif borrowed by Ben Kelly in his design for the Manchester nightclub for Hacienda. There was an image that was gonna follow that, but um, not to worry. There. The welding bay always had an attraction for me. The welder always nomadic, slightly eccentric, and on occasion, despite being white, managed by the end of his shift to be a shade blacker than me. Beads of sweat revealing his masquerade of black dust, hidden from view behind a curtain, a curtain for the dramatic, quietness, until the anticipation of the arc, a kind of al alchemy that went off like rock concert pyrotechnics, flashing light, illuminating and reflecting off every surface. Always the fear that if you, your look lingered too long on the arc, you might be turned to stone. The workshop also harbors and refracts sounds, metal on metal, an all-encompassing noise that could at moments bash your head in, crush you with its relentlessness. But at times, and if you allowed your mind to wander, the noise, its clatter, its whirring, its low deep rumble could sink, creating something quite beautiful, quite complex. Whilst writing this, it reminded me how everybody in the 90s was sort of frothing over the vacuous guitar bollocks of Blur versus Oasis. Meanwhile, just down the road in the steel city of Sheffield, in fact, all across Yorkshire and the country's in, in industrial centers, urban youth were creating sonic symphonies out of the memory and jarring of raw steel being skewered and forged into finished objects. Like Chicago, like Detroit, the music would allude to and forage to make sense of the post industrial landscape their makers would be birthed into. For me now looking back, the whole language of sculpture was encompassed within these spaces. I was schooled in every department, assemblage, fitting, spray painting, constructing, welding. Before I had a sculptural lan language to call my own, I was aware of these processes. I went to art school late in, on in my life, no foundation studies. I'm basically straight in at the deep end. And I feel this egg timer running away with me and the quick realization that I can't paint. Luckily, I'm in Leeds at a time when it's all about the sculptural object, the sculptural canon. You've literally got the ghost of Henry Spencer Moore breathing down your neck and you adhere slavishly to the writings of Lucy Lippard and Rosalind Krauss. It's a serious business and comes at a time when within the art world, there is a historical revisioning that puts sculpture at the forefront of contemporary debate, culminating probably in the exhibition Modern British Sculpture at the Royal Academy. These many conversations allow me to see a variety of material manipulations, giving me a ready cooked language that I could be conversant with, that I could hit the road running with. Before I had a sculptural language to call my own, I was aware of these processes. I was aware of the detritus that might form across a floor or be the residue of a reductive process yet to be swept up, scatter pieces. I was aware of a highly finished component, simplified forms that were collected, stacked and arranged to reduce space, minimalism. And, um, or wrapped 
in shrink wrap to protect them from the elements as they were put on the back of a lorry, Christo and Jean-Claude. Before I had a sculptural language to call my own, I was aware of these as processes that had an aesthetic potential. My working life gave me a familiarity with varied material processes, machine technology, batch production, automated production, regulated shapes and sizes, surfaces, and finishing processes. It gave me an appreciation of scale and size, weight and presence. At times you could manhandle objects. I mean, earlier I spoke of, spoke of poses you might have to assume in order not to be found out or have the validity of your gender question. But rather foolhardily, these poses helped you overcome or bluff the fact that this was immensely dangerous work, a mental block that was needed when fear allowed, allowed large hunks of metal to push you around, showing both your frailty and inane fleshiness. But more important, importantly, what this time gave me was the skills and the confidence to make things, to see processes evolve and become more than the sum of their parts. It's the same confidence when transferred to the current projects that I now undertake, that allow me to envisage and construct things spatially and sonically with greater presence than myself. I try to deny this experience, but in reality, this is where my development starts with objects and physicality and dirt in this last creaking bastion of male preserve. And that's where I finish. Simeon, that was compelling stuff. <laughs> and if you can uh, turn your screen share off now. Oh yeah, sorry. Thank you. So we're all back in the room again. I felt kind of hypnotized by that. That was really compelling stuff. And also um, kind of struck by the language that you were using to describe what you were doing in your engineering apprenticeship and the language that we use to describe sculpture and the language that's used to describe fabrication processes. Um, and also I think the, the kind of, um, the, 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 the gender aspect of it is kind of interesting. We may come back to that. Um, so to begin with, um, there are a lot of, threads that have run through all four of your talks um, that I think it would be really nice to start trying to pick up on them. Um, there are a few things that have struck me straight away, things like um, the idea of translating, um, translating things from one medium to another, from one scale to another, um, translating language. Um, so the idea of translation, I think, is something that it would be really nice um, to maybe think about a bit more to begin with. We're getting lots and lots of questions coming in um, in the chat as well. So um, we'll, we will um, uh, go through all of the, the audience questions as much as we can too. But um, I'm not sure who to kick this question at first, but perhaps um, Karen and Rui, I think you spoke um, a lot about translating things. Um, could you say a little bit more about um, your experiences of translating things between um, different media and different scales? Rui, perhaps we could, we could begin with you because you've been kind of on the sharp end of, um, of making, fabricating things. Of, um, what do you mean, of Nigel's direction? Of, uh, <laughs> um, uh, translate, well, trans well, I think, um, well, we touched on something uh, that I think you might come to that, um, I might co connect, which is um, the connection with the artists and the translation between the artist and the, and the artwork. Um, and that also is reflect reflects the, the degree of involvement of the artist with the artwork, their perception of the technicalities involved, and so how much of your input, how much of their input, um, comes into this and into play really. Um, so it be, 
because your job is not creating, your job is to uh, materialize. Um, your job is to be the sort of uh, the residue of, of, of this knowledge that will materialize the idea of the artist. There's no, there's no mistaking about authorship. There's, 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 you have to be very focused on what you're doing. Um, and if you can help along the process, then, then that's, that's, that's great. That's to the best of your knowledge, um, I think. Hmm. Karen, perhaps you could also say a little bit more about that and about how you you translate from different processes. Because your your work, we saw a, a few examples of how you'd worked through different types of, of material and process um, to create something completely different from where it started um, and the, the kinds of um, translations that you go through in your art processes. Mm -hmm. um... Just trying to think what the best thing, because there's a few. I mean, yes, I think it, in general, it's for me, it's often to do with scale in terms of imagining something, you know, from here, like onto something else, which then has a few few problems in a sense. Like if you make something, you know, it's relatively large scale in your own in your own space. You put it on the outside of the building and suddenly tiny. So how does that relate, you know, like in a sense or scaling or not necessarily by um, enlarging, but by commanding or like by commanding space or by understanding um, proportions or something. I mean, that's one thing I think. Um, I'm trying to think in terms of translation, what I said, and <laughs> how I can... Um, I mean, I think what you said, Rui, um, there's definitely something that's to do with also collaborating with people that know more than you and that possibly have, you know. Well, but like, sorry, I, I, kinda, I think I've kind of missed the point. We talk about the scale. Um, uh, yes, uh, because I think you, you were talking to pick up on what I've said about the scale and about the, 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 the size of the people in the artwork and this sort of like having this kind of transposition between the idea uh, into into something larger mm -hmm. is this what you you were trying to say but um yeah um not necessarily in a in a direct sense as in enlarging or transposing but i was more talking about from my own experience and as in i think from a let's let's say from a teaching point of view or from a sort of experience point of view which i think is the bottom of all of what we're talking about maybe a sort of a sort of artist imagine imagination or I guess fabrication is not necessarily strictly only technical but it's also to do with how you make through your own experience I, I would imagine well that no, is very imaginative when yeah. you have to combine all these solutions and and you you, yeah. you know you have an understanding of 3d printing and you have an understanding of the limitations yeah. of 3d printing and then 3d scanning and then all of a sudden you also know about uh, traditional waste mold making um yeah. so the the way that you can combine these things but mm -hmm. that, i think that's why it's so and that i mean Although I love working, making my own um, timetable and going to the studio when I want. And uh, I also miss, miss working with the team because I know how uh, valuable it is um, in, this, in this kind of, in the, in the creation uh, business to be able to bounce back people uh, and technic solutions to be able to bounce back people. Um, and often, if, even if I'm working alone, I find myself calling um, friends of mine um, that fabricators that I know that will be able to contribute something. And it's, it's, it's kind of like, a, and we have that in the MDN, you know, if you don't know something you ask, someone else will know. And then you kind of bounce that with something you know, and then you create something. And that, that spirit is, is, is quite amazing. Yeah. Simeon, can I ask you in relation to your work, because your experiences as um, a fabricator working in that industry and, and having all those different kind of experiences during your apprenticeship. How does that affect the way that you produce your work now? Because you kind of have those translation skills to an extent. You, you, like you said, you're, you're coming into it with this language and with this, this idea of problem solving already um, from your experiences. Um. Yeah, um, I feel like I'm conversant in the language, but to be honest, I wasn't 
if I look back, I, I, I don't think I was a star there. I, I, I think I was, um, yeah, I was holding on by the skin of my teeth within that environment. I mean, it takes a certain type of, um, it takes a certain quite, well, it takes a certain quality in order to um, be efficient. I think I, in, that, in that environment, I was far too much, I was far too much of a dreamer. Um, so um, I tend now to, whether it's small company, well, generally it's smaller companies. I find that you're able to access smaller companies in a way that large companies um, give you the time of day. You know, it's all about a product and it, their production is all set up for this one product. So you coming in with your, it's all about numbers. So you coming in with your one-off, um, you know, it means nothing to them. So I tend to work with smaller companies that I can get behind, I can actually get into the workshop, I can actually access the workshop and see what, what is available to me, see what I see what is possible. And um, the what where the benefit lies is in the fact that I can I'm conversant in the language it's it's quite a you have to put well especially in Leeds I sense um you, you know you have to work within a persona some of it is quite about um um some of it's quite banter based some some of it is quite um you know, conversant based. So if you have that language and you're able to have some authority as to what you might know, then I suppose there's an opportunity then for that per, for, for that company to sort of think, all oh, right, he's not messing about. He's actually got a sense of what he wants, what he wants to do. So yeah, I, it tends to be smaller companies um that i tend to work with and um have done for a for a while now nigel can i ask you as well um in terms of working with artists um the the fabricator is going to have a role in things that we've been talking about in terms of translating an idea and figuring out the problem solving and the process and so on can you speak a bit more about how um different artists engage with fabricators and the, the role of the fabricator in terms of translating the ideas, different artists, different approaches and so on. Yes, very varied, I think is the first comment there. I'm thinking of um, different artists that we've worked with and the, the extremes that they can come at you with, with the ideas. So from one, one end, you'll get like a full 10 gigabyte mega file of information that's got everything thought out and very well explained and technically adept and there's no interpretation. It's just, can I have one of these please? And there's no, there's no question. At the other end of the scale, we've had artists that have sung as songs and said, this is the song, but I want it in three dimensions. And then they'll say, could you do some sketches and come up with some ideas about what I can have? And that's like the other, the other end of the information um, highway. That's really when you get to um, help people along. Um, a lot of people approach us because they, they're not quite sure how to make something, but they know what it is they wanna make. So you can then, help them with um, techniques and technology, um, just purely because we've got the experience of doing it. What we try never to do is to bully anyone into doing it if they don't like what we're talking about. You always try and let the, the artist or the maker um, lead the way. 
And you get, a, I mean, Simeon touched on it of speaking the language. You get, you, when you talk to other makers and artists and sculptors, you, that you, you can tell, because you're talking the same language. You know what you're on about each other. You, you, you communicate very quickly and very enthusiastically with other makers just because you're fellow kind of nerdy makers and you you speak the language really fluently so it's very quick when you do get that bond and you can develop ideas to how they would be finished quite quickly um, but it's it's so varied you can't really say there's any one way of communicating or translating the ideas because they just come from all over the place so you've just got to be um super flexible friendly and pragmatic <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I said that's you all over. <laughs> um, we're, we're getting a lot of questions um, in the chat about skills, but from different points of view. Um, so both the skills you need to be a fabricator and the skills that are useful for students and emerging artists in terms of working with fabricators. Um, what what kinds of things you need to know and and how you learn these um and how you you've all learned different skills in different ways um in terms of your own backgrounds but do you have any advice uh for people in terms of working with fabricators nigel while you're still unmuted perhaps we can we can get your thoughts on that yeah, well, the, I think the, when you looked at those photographs, um, when I was banging on earlier about the range of work that we get involved with, it's very hard to say you do this or that or this or that, because there's so many different skills that are involved and you use everybody's skills. It's, it's a real um, community effort. It's not one particular thing that you can learn that's going to lead the way. It's, it's gen what, I, what I used to say to people is, what did you used to do when you're a teenager? Did you sit in your bedroom making things and kind of gluing things together? And did you, was that you? And if they say yes, you generally know that they've got an aptitude for making stuff. And it's as, it's as simple as that. It's if people like to make things, you can tell and they will learn on the job as well as getting whatever qualifications they may have got from tech college or art school. But they learn so quickly when you put them in a place where you've got a specific task to do. It's very quick learning curve just because you've got a lot of information around you, a lot of people that are experienced and it's in you anyway. You just you love it, love making things. So the particular skills that are good at the minute that I'm lacking in, in particular are the digital skills. So when I started, it was all about knocking nails in and sawing bits of wood and welding bits of metal together and sculpting in clay. Whereas now it's all about, can you draw this on ZBrush, ZBrush, sorry. Can you do, do this in Rhino and then can you CNC it or laser it or 7 axi cut it? And that those are the skills that I don't have, but those are the skills that we'd look for yeah. in people, as well as all the other more sort of run-of-the-mill skills like woodwork, metalwork, mold making, casting, um, model making, painting, um, spraying, sanding and filling, everything off, well, probably about 90% of the things we make seem to exist in the world of sanding and filling. There will be sanding, there will be <laughs> There's always sanding and filling, yeah. Um, so I don't think you can teach, you can learn that anywhere though. But So I think, I think that the short answer in all that is um, whatever skills you've got, you could probably bring to the table of fabricating and they'll fit in somewhere. <laughs> when people ask you or you a sculptor what, uh, what material it's like I mean whatever material the situation requires it's just um, it's, it sounds really twatty thing to say but it's 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 just it's you just learn to um direct your uh, your skills really so yeah Karen, could, could you uh, tell us more about that question from your perspective as someone who is teaching at yeah Level. Yeah, I mean, it's complicated because, as was said earlier as well, I think we don't teach in a direct sense. You can't really teach it because it could be anything. It could be a super low tech and or extremely like high end, you know, and in a way for me, it's to do with getting the students to understand where to look or how to look or how to make the work and how to be in touch with the work and also 
I think we teach through research in a sense that um, awareness of being in collaboration with the rest of the world. I mean, it's not like you're not in isolation as an artist, I don't think ever. And um, who do you find to, to get what you can't make, you know, or, or how do you make it yourself? And, and if you then need extra help, how do you do it? But I mean, you know, there's so many different ways it can, sculpture can be anything. Um, I mean, I like the idea of the sound translation, to, translating into a, a kind of object. I wonder who that was. <laughs> Tell him. No. <laughs> but, uh, you know, yeah, I think, or the back of an envelope, I can imagine that there's all sorts of things. And from my point of view, I don't think um, it's, I mean, we often have this situation when we set up the exhibitions with the students, that there's a translation element there from, you know, the work leaves the studio and goes into a space it's installed and some people then go into, um, you know, 3D, um, you know, sort of a sketch up program or something to visualize an exhibition. And it's definitely not a solution necessarily. And that's, to me, a sort of, you know, it's the same as, you know, you can't necessarily make your work um, in Rhino and then expect it to be a kind of thing that you've imagined unless that's part of your, I, I don't know, you know, there's no, it's a, there's no one way to do it. I think it's to do with understanding maybe that translation and, and how do you get there? And I think we teach through, we teach skills to some extent, but not directly. We teach through workshops. We also, um, we have problem solving things like say for example in ceramics, you know, where technicians kind of go well, you know, experimental sort of skills. But then of course we teach mold making, you know, there's, um, but again, you know, I think at the slave, for example, I mean, I can only speak for what we do. You can pretty much make anything more or less um, and people will help you to make it. Um, but we can't possibly teach literally all the skills to every student because, because that isn't gonna work. I mean, they come in a way to the workshop with the set of, I wanna make this, this is the sort of way it goes. But then of course, if somebody doesn't know anything, I mean, I don't know, you know, it's, it's complicated because people wanna try things and, you know, their basic introduction courses for all the different printmaking techniques or, you know, um, Literally, I mean, I think um, high end and low end, you know, digital and analog technologies and techniques are available, but um, it's also about, you know, how do you, um, through your imagination, get to where you want to be and then you find something on, along the way, I think, yeah. Yeah. Um, we're, we're getting um, loads of questions through um, and one question that's um, come up uh, again, which I think everybody on the panel can speak to actually, is about the idea of making and artists making work and fabricators making the work and the line between the different kinds of making that's involved in that, the, the, the line between fabrication and concept. Um, I think that the, the question is getting towards ideas of, of sort of, ownership and so on but I think you've been very clear Rui and Nigel that that you don't own the work this is the artist's work and you're facilitating the realization of that work um, but maybe we can we can unpack this idea about artists not making their own work and what that that kind of means uh, more broadly um, and I know this is kind of tricky because Simeon and Karen you do make a lot of your own work. Um, so Simeon, maybe you could say a bit more about your relationship with fabricators in terms of, of the actual making of work. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, there us what usually happens is um, it's a process that obviously I start off initially and then um, there's sort of a mid period and that's probably where the fabricator would come in and then it might come back to me and I, and I finish it. But I mean, it's been a while, I'd say, since I was, you know, I mean, early on, it was a necessity to make my own work and, um, but, 
yeah, early on, it was a necessity to make my own work. But I suppose that I wanted, in my own work, I wanted, uh, I wanted a distance. I wanted, I, I, I was really trying to, and, and this sort of reads into the sorts of materials that I, I use, um, you know, and the sort of finishes that I require. And um, I, wa I wanted that sort of distance. I wanted to um, sort of isolate myself from, from the making. Um, but um, yeah, in the, in the process of, um, um, you know, taking on fabricators, um, yeah, it, it's always my work and, um, you know, they're just facilitating that they're, they're in the role of sort of facilitating whatever's going on in my head and and um bringing that into the world bringing that you know making that real in a sense um but yeah no i i don't have any bones i don't i don't have any bones with that idea of you know um i, I think it, there's a long history of this way of working, you know, yeah, we talk, talk about Michelangelo and even, you know, people like Hearst, you would talk about, you know, a, a large sort of, um, um, a sort of organization in the relation to sort of manufacturing and producing work. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think there's, I, th I think there is a point at which, you know, maybe you need to let go and, and so you, you definitely, you need to let go um, of that process. Um, um, it was essential to me, definitely. So I could sort of think about over, over elements of the process. So, yeah. It's historically a, a romantic idea of, you know, the solo creator, the solo artist that kind of like makes everything on its own. And, so, and it's, 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 it's in terms of aura and the creation aura is very, it's a very sellable idea to have the solo artist over there just making everything and you forget that, you know, you can't possibly, David can't possibly broken, you know, that whole block um, on, on, on its own. I think there's a, because I, I'm just aware of the time, but there's loads of people are asking about the money and the access to fabrication. I was just going to come to that one, yeah. Was, um, <laughs> and, the, and I think, I think uh, because when we were working at MDM, there was, and I remember when, the, um, and Nigel did that a couple of times. Sometimes um, students came along and uh, obviously you can't afford to have the whole force of the studio working for you. But then what happened what, uh, what, what happened a couple of times where you would just ask someone, you know, if they want to do it individually. Um, sometimes you can't afford it because some of those people are saying like, well, this is really nice and pretty if you, if you can afford a fabricator. Uh, but what if you can't? And, and my suggestion is just, just ask. I mean, the amount of times I just talk on the phone with people suggesting things, you know, for no money. I mean, obviously, you know, if it involves time and things, oh, this is this is what we do for a living. But um, it, sometimes I just suggest to ask, you know, um, to ask for help, ask for technical advice, call someone. You know, uh, you'd be we surprised. We spend how many an awful lot of time uh, answering people's phone calls where they're just wondering how the hell can I do this? What, Sorry, what's the next step? And it's exactly that. You just you offer the advice for free because it's it's potential seeds for future whatevers, and it's enjoyable. We like talking about such things and how you make stuff. Um, ring us up, ask us if you want to know how to do something, and we'll try and help. Um, and it's you know, <laughs> no charge, but be gentle. Yeah, I know, but there there there, there are groups. There's like the the Pangea setup is is a place where you can. Uh, you know, call and ask uh, for technical things. I've, I've, I've called, I've talked to students in Hong Kong over the phone of, uh, you know, over some mold making questions they had regardless of finishing. And this is, you know, this is kind of like an insane other side of the world call uh, just to help out over a session. Then you have a little follow up and you ask how they're going. And then, you know, it's just the best you could do um, than the circumstance, but just call really just, just ask people. Yeah. yeah. I, th I think a lot of people are worried that when they leave um, like art school, when they leave university, that that community that's been established at university just kind of goes poof and everyone's out there on their own and it doesn't exist anymore and you can't ask anybody anymore. But actually, I think what's coming across is that you can. It does exist. It does exist. There are people. And it's a favor, but you can, you know, uh, this, it's, it's a thing that I think people need to have, people will be surprised how people are receptive sometimes. 
I've contacted artists directly in the past, and you'd be surprised how many people just get back to you when on a direct email. It is it is quite amazing, you know? Just just try. Well, we that's quite a nice note, I think, to end on actually. That <laughs> that there are lots of possibilities out there, and that fabrication as a as a field is much more accessible, I guess, than people think it is. Um, and that, that you guys are not scary. <laughs> and that, that people can talk to you about these things. Um, and that that learning the language and the, the terminology and the translation skills does develop over time. You do, you can learn that and you can talk to people about it. Um, well, I'd like to thank all of you for helping to kind of smash some myths about fabrication uh, and to share your experiences and to open up what we hope is going to be um, a really educational, amongst other things, uh, season of events. So thank you so much to Simeon Barclay, to Rui Pinatelli, to Karen Rugaba, to Nigel Schofield and to Lucy Tomlins from Pangea. Um, this has been a really fantastic discussion. I could talk to you guys all night, but it's 7.30. So <laughs> we'll all go and get a drink. And I hope that um, everybody out, of, out there who's joined us this evening can also join us this time next week for our discussion with Thomas J. Price in conversation at six o'clock next Wednesday evening. Thank you so much, uh, and we will see you all again very soon. Thank you. Thanks.